physiology. The anatomy of the Gorgon can range from being very relatable to our own to quite complex depending on the physical structuring we go with. The Gorgon could be presented as an enormous, terrifying head phantom, to a half-lion, half-fish-bodied creature, to being centaur-like, to having a hermaphrodite, demonic, winged appearance, to being lower snake-bodied, to being an attractive human female, all with or without the combinations of being entirely scaled with or without snakes atop the head, or wings, and of course with or without the ability to change humans and possibly other creatures to stone. We'll fiddle with the appearance shortly. Let's first explore the physiology of how it can all work, focusing on the more fantastical areas of the Gorgon. And first and foremost, we shall explore the area that most commonly stays consistent. The Gorgons or Medusas, if you want to stay truer to Hesiod's telling, ability to turn people to stone. This feature can be expressed in also a variety of ways, as the original writings were not so clear. Those who simply look at the Gorgon turn to stone. I like to be looked at, and I like to look too. Those that the Gorgon looks at turn to stone. Or, how most seem to entertain this idea, those turn to stone that make eye contact with a gorgon. Something to consider if you're currently working on a lore involving a gorgon or gorgons. Maybe your gorgon has yet a more interesting way of turning trespassers to stone. Or maybe it's not even stone, but some other type of material that is very prized among apothecaries. Hmm. Back on point. While this ability can be shrugged off as just being magic, many lore writers of today will not simply just stop there. Even the science of magic is explained in depth in some writings. I like to remove that dividing line between magic and science and merely state that magic is a science that is not yet understood. So with the stoning ability, starting with the eye contact method, one more believable explanation could be that the victim is put into a state of hypnosis. Possibly some white noise from a rattle at the end of the snake tail might assist in this. Within this hypnosis, the Gorgon directs a manipulative suggestion into the wanderer's mind that encourage it into a full belief that the person is frozen or petrified. The hypnosis being so powerful as to keep the victim immobile until starvation or something even worse kills it. In this case, it would make most sense that the Gorgons stay present at all times. This may also be a reason for not seeing petrified animals within the vicinity of a Gorgon, as their minds would be too simple to fall to such mental exploitation. Another explanation to the stoning gaze ability pertaining to any of the aforementioned methods could be via rays or waves. This more in line with magic would relate to, simply put, energy waves encompassing such complex structures that when in contact with skin or flesh would restructure the carbon base away from other elements resulting in a very fragile dark silhouette of a victim upon a puddle of diverted bodily fluids mostly water. Depending on the approach, these waves could be emitted off the entire gorgon or through directed channels from the pupils in its eyes. A thing to keep in mind here as a creator could be to pay close attention to showing how and from where the stoning process begins on or in the sufferer. What other fascinating ways can you think up in bringing realism as we know it to the stone gaze? The other notable peculiarity that doesn't always show in the versions of the Gorgon is the snake-bodied bottom half. Imagining the skeletal and exterior structure is much less of a challenge than the interior anatomy. Would most of it remain the same, being predominantly in the human portion of the creature, leaving for a long serpentine bottom lined with muscles to provide for a powerful base and offensive point with one lightly vulnerable region within, the cloaca or cloacae, and the canals that lead to it within the body. Here the cloacae also neatly helps to blur the definite sex of the creature, as the scale that covers it holds the secret of the creature's gender. The cloacae within the vent in snakes and some other animals releases excrement as well as eggs for reproduction. In males, the hemipenes can be found below it, and in the topic of hermaphroditism, this is where both male and female sexual organs can exist, although in this case, zoologists refer to it as being intersex, such as in the case of 
of some golden lancehead snakes, as there are slight differences to it being a true hermaphrodite. Fittingly, along the slithery part of the gorgon, we can reach out and now overanalyze the dangerous layer of the serpents upon his or her, its head. Considering how the snake bodies visually merge here, the skull of the gorgon would most likely not be as solid as ours at the crown, as at the least the snake's nerve bundles would lead into the skull through tiny holes. In this case, a larger head would make sense, as in the early depictions, where the gorgon did in fact have a large head. Unless, of course, the nerves and possibly the trachea ran around the exterior of the skull into the body of the gorgon somewhere through the upper neck region. The consequence obviously being an especially vulnerable area and also one that could help explain why gorgons, if as a species, have developed such a potent ability as the petrifying stare. I would imagine contemplating whether the snakes have any complex organs unnecessary as the complex and complete entirety of the gorgon can provide them with everything they need in order to hiss, squirm, and bite. And at this final chapter of the gorgon's mysterious makeup, we return to its gender. I would be happy to amuse the idea of gorgons being male and female, as well as being intersexual. Though looking back at the gorgon's ancient designs and to that of possibly relating figures, sexual ambiguity is really prevalent. Again, even Aix or Aix, the gorgon who was obscure in gender, supposedly fathered Medusa. So in the scope of pre-common era lore, no matter how mixed up it got, I would maybe ever so slightly lean towards gorgons being hermaphrodites or intersexual. As far as the topic of breeding would go, it would be mostly similar as with mates of the opposite sex. If humanoid below, then reproduction would proceed as in humans. If reptilian, than as in reptiles. One last interesting aspect that deserves attention here are the breasts. If they are there, then why? Cold-blooded creatures such as this would appear to be don't require milk after birth. Therefore, your gorgon could be warm-blooded and provide milk. Or, I ask you to consider this intriguing angle that Christopher Stoll brought up upon the breasts of mermaids in his book A Natural History of the Fantastic. It nicely illustrates the needlessness for nipples, as the quote-unquote breasts were evolved buoyant reserves of fat that aided the mermaid in swimming. Hmm, and now this conception begs the question, which came first, the human or mermaid? Which evolved from which? Size. As for size, what we commonly see is like that of a human or taller. With the snake anatomy added, the weight composed with a humanoid counterpart would be estimated at an additional 300 to 1,000 pounds. Therefore, such a gorgon's weight being in the range of 350 to 1,200 pounds, with a body length from 10 to 30 feet or even more. As aforementioned, gorgons usually appear around this size but never really smaller. But how fun would it be to imagine smaller gorgons, for example with an associated snake type being a black and white king snake, or an adder such as a gaboon viper. Terror in a small compact package. Appearances. Color. If snake or reptile based, your gorgon can virtually be any color we are able to perceive. Reptiles and amphibians are among the most colorfully diverse creatures on this planet. And so here as an artist, you can really let yourself go and get creative, but not without some great references to help keep your creation realistic. Think about what type of snake your gorgon could be based off of. For instance, check out this cobra based one for the God of War game. It has everything you'd hope for and more. If you're basing yours off of a known snake, then would you continue that species look onto the hair snakes? Or would you have different type of snake designs? One for the hair slash snakes and another for the main body of the gorgon. Would you at least keep the themes to a specific group of snakes such as venomous or non-venomous? Maybe the gorgon's snake body would be that of a non-venomous python or say your gorgon has fangs of venom and therefore the snake body is that of a highly venomous coral snake. Or maybe, maybe your gorgon's bottom half isn't based on a snake reptile type at all, but rather a lizard. It's closer to home with the gorgon of those ancient awkward designs. But then again, we are talking monsters and maybe you do want that very different look. On this, I would like to steer away from the idea that the gorgon is a reptilian at all. 
when we return to later Hesiod's version, we are reminded that Gorgons were the result of the union between Phorcys and Cato, who also as brother and sister were the result of Gaia's, Mother Earth's, union with Pontus, who was also Gaia's creation or son. Confusing? Bear in mind that there are conflicting family trees of Greek mythologies and to create a clear one for you would be even more of a headache than the animal kingdom diagram I designed and presented on the channel. And back to the point, Pontus was the personification of the sea. His bonded son and daughter Phorcys and Cato, as mentioned before, were naturally also both sea deities. Therefore, I would think it more appropriate for the Gorgon daughters to be more like their parents and be more aquatic slash marine bodied, like having lower bodies of fish possibly even combined with crabs or crayfish, relating more to Phorcys' anatomy. But this could easily get confusing with mermaids and such. In this case, I would suggest for the Gorgons to have the lower bodies of eels as they are more sea and marine related than snakes. But what could even be more pleasing is finding a stronger middle ground between the snake and sea aspect of the Gorgon. And this, my friends, are sea snakes. They are very aquatic, fully adapted for marine life, maybe even more so than sea turtles. Their colors and patterns have a brilliant range and they are highly venomous. What a Gorgon that would be. Possibly very similar to this Naga. Would it be purely aquatic or amphibious? Also, don't forget to factor in, if your gorgons do indeed come in two sexes, what are the differences between them? In snakes, for example, the differences are unrecognizable to the common eye, whereas in fish, they may vary greatly. And as a final note to the appearances of gorgons, do keep in mind the scales skin layout if you are to apply scales. Snakes have large bottom scales, while in lizards, you don't see that much variation in scale size. And although it may be tough, but maybe your gorgon is even more unique and has a completely different layout of scales than no creature on Earth we know of has. Personality and character. Cold and dry, or rivaling with the Gorgon's appearance, warm and ultra caring. Going back to the serpents of now, I would picture a reclusive nature, an attitude of, if you don't bother me, I won't bother you. But with that godly blood in them, who knows, Gorgons could flow as agreeably with others as the tides, or splash upon thee in the vein of a horrendous wave, or both, depending on the mood or season. Well, monster lovers, you have come this far. I hope to see you in the concluding episode of All About the Gorgon.